I'm down here today because I want to give maybe my, you might feel more comfortable asking questions or whatever. We've done this in times past, so it's been some time, and I wanted to um, go into this more as a study that opens it up for if you have any questions. And, and if you don't understand something I go over, I want you to feel free to interrupt me and um, go ahead and uh, ask about it. I want to talk about civil government, but I want to talk about it beginning with thunder. <laughs> uh, the origin of civil government. We're living in an age that says civil government and the idea of it comes from man. That's just not the case. And uh, I want us to understand better, it's going to be a, uh, in putting this together, I was trying to figure out how I wanted to go at it, so uh, I'm going to be skipping around some, you probably will be able to tell that, but anyway, I want to go at it so that uh, we can start back behind the beginning. Can you go behind the beginning? Well, we can if we go to God, because God was before the beginning. Civil government had its origin from the mind and will of Almighty God. Now remember, we as humans are created in the image of God. We talked about that not long ago. And that means there is the imprint of deity upon us. Doesn't make us deity. But there is the moral imprint of the divine being upon our spirits, for he is, as the writer of Hebrews says, the father of spirits. We get our bodies from our parents. God fathers our inward man, our spirit. And as the writer of old said, when we die, our spirits return to God who gave it. Now we get more specific as to what that means as far as what the Bible is even taught on it. But we're interested in understanding and emphasizing that man has imprinted upon him order. We often talk about the fact man has a sense of oughtness, a moral sense of oughtness, that a thing ought to be this way, ought not be that way. And thus an atheist who says God does not exist is offended when he sees little children brutally killed. He can't explain why he's offended, but I know what he doesn't know or will not learn, and that is because he has built in his spirit that which is the moral imprint of God. Well, there is then, because God is a God of order. Sometimes we may overlook this, but when we speak of angels, and then we speak of archangels, we must recognize that that's order of angels in authority over other angels. That's in heaven. We also have the model prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The will of God. There's the governing power, there's the guideline, there's the standard. Because of what God is, there has to be rules and regulations. That's how we would say it. There has to be law, in other words. So, civil government originated in the mind of God and not in the mind of men. I would say right here is where the great battleground is today, not on some of the particulars that are implied by man if he says it all begins with man and there's no God, but the very fact that we need to point out there wouldn't be any civil government except that there was a God and he made man want to have government. The most pagan of peoples have governments. Why? Just like the most pagan of peoples will have laws pr protecting life. They may be very crude and far away from what the Bible teaches about that. But nevertheless, why does a man do that? Why do all of the various uh, peoples, such as tribes, why do they have order? You know, they'll have a chief or they'll have some sort of ruling council and they'll have some sort of laws. They even will have crimes and that they punish Though it may be very barbarian and cruel, why do human beings do this? Many of them not even believing in the God of the Bible. 
It's because there is within them that which says decently and in order. So its divine source is unequivocally stated in the Bible. And I'll pick two primary scriptures. There are many, but uh, Romans 13, 1 through 7, you would expect that. But where Peter virtually is teaching the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17. Now mark those down. We'll come back to them later. But I would say uh, there it's made very clear that law, government, you can't have one without the other comes from the mind of the Almighty and that man being a creature of God and having the imprint on his spirit of God also has a sense of things being done decently in order or rules and regulations to guide them. And the most pagan and frankly mean people, the crude, ruthless people will have laws. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm making this idol in a certain time. Everybody's going to bow down to it. Well, here he wasn't talking about the God of the Bible. He wasn't talking about worshiping according to the Bible, anything like that. But he said, here's a law. <laughs> and you've got to do it or there's consequences to be paid. Where does that come from in a person? How does uh, matter in motion come up with something like that? So men are instruments through which God carries out His purposes in civil government fitted for this present world. And may I also say, since this world is the place we get ready for the next, and it's perfect for what God made it to be to get ready for the next, then civil government has a place to play in that. It's not by accident we have civil governments. But the conception of civil government comes from the mind of God and not from men. You can see why humanists, secular humanists, who say that man is the measure of all things, you can see why when they do away with God, somebody's got to be the one to create law. So they come up with all sorts of things. And of course, man is the measure of all things, or you wouldn't have laws protecting abortion. You wouldn't have a number of things like that. The Holy Spirit of God revealed to the Apostle Paul that there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Now that's the first verse of Romans 13 where you're going to come across that. Now here's where we're going to get a little technical, and I don't expect everybody to understand this, but you can follow what we're doing because remember, remember, the New Testament of Jesus Christ was originally given in Koine Greek. The words that are in the Greek New Testament are the words that are the ones the Holy Spirit had the inspired writers to choose. And I want us to keep that in mind. The Greek adverbial negative that's in these words of Paul, Romans 13, 1, is idiomatically in the emphatic position in that phrase. So literally, the Greek phrase is ugar estin exousia I may hupo for you. Now, what does that mean to you? <laughs> Sounds. That's what it means to you for the most part. But literally translated, when you put that into English to get out of the Greek that God actually gave for us to understand, it means no, for there is authority except from God. We would say it in our vernacular, there's no authority except from God. Period. There's no authority except from God. Even Jesus says, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Somebody had to be the giver. So in the Father, the first person of the Godhead, all authority inheres. Thus the Father gave all authority to the second person of the Godhead who is the executor of the Father's will for a certain limited period of time. Because we learn from 1 Corinthians 15 that he's going to deliver up the kingdom to God at the end of things and put down all rule and all authority and it'll all inherit back to the Father. Isn't that interesting? What will that be like? Well, let's live so that we can be there and witness it. That's the biggest thing I can say. So, that's what Paul is saying to the church and of all places the capital imperial city of Rome. 
That's what he says. And that's important. Because Romans, and I'll say more about this later, Romans fixated on power. Power was everything to them. Now when you look at Mark, who basically wrote his gospel to the Romans, the Latin-speaking world, if you'll take note, in every chapter, he emphasizes the power of Jesus. That will get a Roman's attention. It's hard for us maybe to understand all of that, but that's it. And thus, they certainly were concerned about you do as the Roman law says. Because their power is extended over the Roman Empire, empire through laws. Now, further, the Greek verb, Tetogmenai, translated instituted in the RSV of Romans 13.1, is a perfect tense participle. Now, there's significance to that to the fellow that's a Greek scholar, and he's going to put into English exactly what the Holy Spirit had Paul write. He's got to know how to do that. That is, he's got to know how to say in English what Paul said in Greek, because the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to choose that word. It's from a root word, tasso, transliterated T-A-S-S-O, which means arranged, set, appointed, ordered, framed, or fixed. So the Greek perfect tense means that the action has happened in the past. You always describe that as linear action. It starts here, but it just keeps on. That's present tense in the Greek verb. It's not like done in the present in English. It can start here, but it can go on and on and on. So if you're illustrating, you always draw a line. Any Greek student knows when you draw a line, you're talking about a present tense verb. It's in the passive mood. And what does that mean? It means that God ordered, that He set, that He fixed the principle of civil government in the past and it keeps on going to the present and until this system of things here on earth passes and civil government fulfills its purpose as to what God designed it to do in this world. In other words, government didn't just flow from the fertile mind of man. It comes from the very fact of what God is. And being that mankind, as I said earlier, has a spirit of God, fathered by God, it bears the imprint of order. And thus you will see throughout the whole of the Bible what Paul said that things ought to be done decently in order. That's true of everything. Because the opposite of decently in order is chaos exactly what it is. And that's not true. God is not a God of chaos. This is one reason that you can talk about evolution and say it's wrong for no other reason. It's by accident. It's a happenstance. That can't be. And there be a God. God acted. He did so in the past. And He continues to do so in the present. To give birth to human government. Now I say birth to human government. I mean the very concept of government. Because most governments don't have a lot of details about them that are approved of God. But the concept of civil government for the human race. And this is the point we're making here at this study. Was not initiated out of man himself. It wasn't a trial and error situation as far as there ought to be order. Now, the order that comes out of a man doesn't believe in God or is a pagan of some sort certainly may not be the order that is presented by God under His revealed Word. Nevertheless, there is that desire for order. So it was in the mind of God from eternity and revealed to humanity. First of all, because of the way men are made. 
the desire to have order, to have uh, law. And I might pause here if you ever have this much interest uh, separate from the study of just the origin of civil government of what is actually civil government you can't, you can't do that very long can't study it very long or very far without studying uh, the matter of law and you can get a PhD in philosophy of law that's how far you can go into it as far as the study of it it'd be very hard to study a government without studying law you just can't do it because how, how does a government institute decently in order, regardless of what its view of decently in order is, except that it has some sort of laws. You want to see that? Look at what Hitler, in view of his philosophy of law and all sorts of other philosophies, look what the Nazis did they took over Germany. They set laws to work, to bring about what they thought ought to be. Didn't make any difference whether those laws were were what God wanted, that still shows that they knew that the government had to have laws that would get done what they thought and their philosophy of law and government ought to take place in Germany as far as they were concerned in the whole world. So if there's structure and if there's direction, you're going to have to have law. And certainly if you've got a government, you're going to have to have structure and, and direction. And all of that did not just arise from man. It comes because there is within man that imprint of God upon his spirit to make him want to do that. Ordered social structure inheres in the very nature of Almighty God, who is, of course, the ultimate ruler of which there is no greater. I guess we can say it this way. God doesn't... He makes nothing disordered. <laughs> Does that help say what we're saying? God makes nothing disordered. Think about the creation of the world. Everything's ordered. Even the days to create and what He created on each day. So when He created the world, He did not create it in a chaotic fashion. Isaiah 45. Verses 18 and 19. Or as I said earlier, He's not the God of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Well, we usually apply that, and the Holy Spirit had Paul apply it to the misuse and abuse of miraculous gifts in the church of Corinth. But don't you know that is a principle that applies to anything God does? He's not the author of confusion when He created the worlds. He's not the author of confusion in anything. It's all done decently in order as it flows from the essence of deity and the attributes that we know him by. Created things and created beings were made to follow divine laws. Jeremiah 5, verse 22. Why are we social beings? You ever wonder why? Because God made us a social being. Man was meant to exist companionably or interpersonally with other beings of like nature as himself. Now in the very basic fundamental smallest unit of society, he made a man and a woman. That's the closest intimate relationship humankind can have. God knew how to do that. So he said when he made man, think about this, all that it means. It's not good for man to be alone. Now think about that. that there's a few words, but my, they carry so far. He's about to say there's a need for a man to have social relationships. But they can't be without laws. This can't happen. So since man is a contingent being, that he's dependent, that is, he's not standing alone, he's dependent. He's not like God, omnipotent in himself. Then he is also in his spirit programmed to acknowledge his need for government. That's the way it works. And if you look at the basic unit 
the home, husband and wife, does the Bible say anything about how each role, that is, how the man's role is thus and so, and the woman's role is thus and so, and then their relationship one to another? Does God legislate on that? Well, He certainly does. So even in that smallest and important intimate relationship, God said there's laws. Laws governing the man as to what he should be as a husband, as a father, and so on, and the wife and the mother. There are laws. So the need, I guess is one way to put it, that's in us, shall we say it this way, was planted by God. Was planted by God. Man didn't create it. Man didn't come up with the idea. An evolutionist has a hard time explaining the existence of woman. You may not realize it, and he doesn't want to focus on it and let you know that, but why was it in chance evolution that you have the male kind coming into being, but then what happened in evolution that the human kind came into being? You ought to read some of the stuff of how they say woman got here. And then you'll wonder how in the world could they reflect on God at the creation account? All this. One of them had, I remember reading some years ago, had the woman, remember it's all chance evolution, survival of the fittest, had women or the female of the species of humankind come into existence uh, through porpoises. Well, that makes a good ground for a lot of jokes, but I can't think of anything other than that, trying to explain how a man came as he came, but a woman came... And it's all so much fantasy. It's all it is. I, I've often thought that one of the best works of fiction that ever came into existence was Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Man's contingency and mortality therefore renders him incapable of originating on his own principles or axioms a sufficient wisdom to guide him in civil government. But he tries, and most civil governments are that way. But now, here we pause to point out some of the philosophers living in the 1600s and back there. One of them, John Locke, who had a tremendous amount of influence on the founding fathers of this country. If you want to read his philosophy, then he wrote on about everything as those philosophers did, but then you have to re read what he wrote on the state and uh, civil government and things like that. Um, then Thomas Hobbes was another one who wrote it. All those philosophers looked at everything. They just said, you know, what's the philosophy behind this, this, this? But when it's always interesting to look at what they had to say about philosophy of civil government. Now, if you want to see how our founding fathers of this country took their pure philosophy on government, civil government, and law, and so forth, then read the Federalist Papers. Because that's where you'll see that they took a lot of that stuff. Not just them, but other philosophies too. Where they took what they learned from them and others and then made application practically to what they wanted in this country. It gets very interesting. And what you may or may not know is that John Locke was very influential over Alexander Campbell. Those philosophers at that time were people who looked at all things with the idea that God is behind it. In other words, they were not secular philosophers. They were not people saying there is no God and we've got to figure out everything otherwise. That's the reason you tend to listen to them more because they begin with the premise we would. God exists. And what does that imply? So God revealed those axioms and guidelines in the natural revelation in nature's God. Does that sound familiar? In human conscience and human capacity to reason. What makes you and me have the ability to reason? Did man evolve reason? Does man have reason because God doesn't exist? Well, how is that possible? I can sit here, and I was talking to a, a school teacher the other day at another place, and I was glad to hear this. 
he's talking about teaching on the sixth grade level. And they had a meeting, he said, of the teachers, and they were talking about, as teachers all know, uh, different teaching plans so that you become a more effective teacher. And one of the things they were saying, and it just thrilled my little heart, a big heart, however way you want to view it, they said the use of true false statements. And I thought, well, that's the way you tend to think through a thing to begin with. And most of the time what comes out of modern education today is it feel good to do it. Or you got your truth, I got my truth, even though they run headlong together and backfire on one another. But I thought, that, that's great. And he was telling me how he was using it. Because you can start just like this. I've got a dime, and the dime is in the envelope, and the envelope is in the attache case, and the attache case is in the trunk of my car. Where is the dime? And if he says, well, it's in the trunk of your car, then he's thinking. He's thinking. And you can do that with a host of things involving life. All sorts of things. Just to think it through. That's what's not happening with the people that are determining what governs government today. It's just not happening. But if you go back into the 17th century, long in that time period, you'll find out great discussions were carried out and uh, people got themselves in a lot of trouble for saying a lot of things. Um, what we're talking about here may have crossed the minds of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and others like that when they thought about and philosophized on democracies because the Greeks did have a democracy, uh, this kind of thing, at least in some places. But I promise you, it does not cross the minds of a great many people who are bent upon political power today who are bent upon getting things done they want done, whether it makes any sense or not, it gives them power and control to get it done. Truth, truth fell through the cracks in the floorboard with those people. So the social essence of man logically or naturally necessitates control, order, or structure. And that's what he tries to do. Man's incapable of existing in absolute freedom. He is finite, not omnipotent or omniscient. His finitude and contingency proposes a necessary regimentation. In other words, he was meant to be under law. That's what it amounts to. And even those who don't believe in God and believe in Christ, or, as well, that's concerning, even a Jew, or a uh, the Muslim, they still come up with some kinds of laws that says man is, if they're to have whatever they need and get along in life, then you have to have these things. There has always been laws governing life, governing uh, falsehoods, or truth, as you might say, governing ownership of property. Always been laws, anywhere in time. Now, why do people do that? Well, it's because built in them is the idea of decency and order. Some way, there's got to be something that makes things work. Because if pure freedom, somebody said freedom's never free, and they meant by that you have laws and real freedom. If not, you have anarchy, and there's everything falls apart. And you've got, as the Old Testament writer said, when there was no king in Israel, in the days of the judges, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, the most ancient form of human social relationship, the family, we've already mentioned. One law that man has been able to fulfill very well is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Genesis 1.28. He's managed that. But a lot of other things that God would have him do in this life, when you understand the design and purpose of life in the flesh, and it's what we're here for, he doesn't. Now let me uh, read some things here that I gleaned from some poking around. You know, that's where you do research, you poke around. Um, a 
authority in civil society. The natural law in ordaining the society in its proper end thereby ordains the means necessary to the attainment of that end. Civil authority is that necessary means. Indeed, without civil authority, the state could not exist. Now go back to Hitler and the Nazi philosophy and what they wanted to accomplish. That's so far from what God would have things. But look, he, he followed the same principle. The Nazi state couldn't be the Nazi state without, without laws that enforced and brought about people complying with the Nazi doctrine. Authority in itself must be distinguished from the form of administration or type of regime. Always, authority is always present irrespective of the will of man and cannot be abolished any more than the law of gravity or that of valence, for example, can be abrogated by humankind. The essence of authority is immutable. It is evident from the fact of natural equality that no human person has any authority per se over any other human person. Hence, no, uh, not having this authority in the first place, that is, primary authority, it follows that no man or group of men can delegate authority to any other man or group of men. The people can determine their form of government and elect men to administer it, but they are powerless to confer authority on these men for the simple reason that they have no inherent authority to confer. As the fellow said, nothing plus nothing equals what? Nothing. Sovereignty is in the people, to be sure, to determine the type of regime and the personal personnel of elected officialdom, but not to confer authority upon those elected to govern. In other words, we have a power to put people into office. But where did the authority of civil government actually come from? It came from the idea of civil government. Where, where did that come from? Well, it comes from God. Um, the biblical teaching is that primary authority comes directly from the author of nature. And that it is by his sufferance that the people exercise whatever measure of sovereignty they may have. Go back and read Romans 13 verse 1 and you will see that's what he says. There's no power but of God and the powers that be are ordained of God. Isn't it amazing how the scriptures say in just a few words what it took all that time for me to read from somebody else? <laughs> That's just that simple. Authority is moral power, and this moral power carries with it the right to use physical power to maintain order. There are three basic rights of which the author of nature or the natural law is the sole efficient cause, rights which need to be exercised by any national state. And this is where law begins to connect, that you can't study one without the other. And we as Christians, under law to Christ and the kingdom of Christ, nevertheless in that kingdom live in this world under civil states and in civil states. These are just punindi, the right to punish, the just obligandi, the right to make and bind laws, and just belli, the right to defend itself by war and force. These powers are necessary for any state to attain its natural and proper end. A state without authority is a joke. As a matter of fact, it is inconceivable. Human character being what it is, subject to every form of selfishness and greed. I thought that was pretty good. Now, that tells me why and if you've been listening to reading the Minor Prophets, where Ken over and over again has said God used these different people of Syria or Babylonia or whatever to punish sinful Israel or Judah at this time or both of them, you'll see that those people, the governments of Assyria or Babylon, were about as wicked as they come. I may get into a little later of some of the laws I dug out that governed the Assyrians, and you're talking about tough. That'd just be as mean as a snake, and apologies to the snake. 
But here is what Alexander Campbell in an essay entitled Is Capital Punishment Sanctioned by Divine Authority? Here's what he wrote. Now I want to remind you that while we know Campbell is the one who called me and back to the Bible and the Bible only is the old rule of faith and practice and uh, that it's a pattern whereby we can restore ancient, pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity and so on. If you study his life, you'll find out that Campbell rubbed shoulders with James Madison. And uh, he spoke one time, I have a copy of that, to the Congress himself. And uh, when you go and visit his home place, they'll, ha they'll tell you about all of the dignitaries of his day that visited there with him because he was of that caliber. Here's what he had to say. Though neither Caesar nor Napoleon, Nicholas nor Victoria were, quote, by the grace of God, unquote, king, emperor, or queen, still the civil throne, the civil magistrate, and therefore civil government are, by the grace of God, bestowed upon the world. Neither the church nor the world could exist without it. God himself has, therefore, benevolently ordained magistrates and judges. Men may call them kings, emperors, or presidents, but they are God's minister, executors or executors of His will and of His vengeance, ordained to wait upon Him and to execute His mandates. They are sort of viceroys, vice regents under law to God and to govern according to His revealed will. The Bible is right, and it ought to be, just as much a law to kings and governors and presidents as it is to masters and servants, to husbands and wives, to parents and children. Those magistrates, therefore, who will not be governed and guided by it in the faithful execution of God's laws, God Himself, in His own proper person, will judge and punish. God is the author of law and order. The devil is the author of anarchy and nihilism. The devil is the enemy of government of any kind. He desires the destruction of all law. He is a liar and there is no truth in him, John 8, 44. He wishes only to scatter, Matthew 12, 30. He apparently led in the rebellion against God's government when certain angels, quote, did not keep their first estate or own position but left their proper dwelling, unquote, Jude verse 3. The devil was an anarchist and nihilist in the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 1, verses following. Then it goes on to say, truth and order, government. Think about it for a minute. Truth and order. Synonym, government. Are mutually dependent on God. God is the source of both. It is the truth of God that produces order, and it's order that sustains truth. Anything that contradicts the truth of God destroys order. When anarchy or disorder rules, there is no way for truth to exist or be sustained. The truth of God is eternal, and there are many scriptures that declare that. That is one of the great consolations in the Bible for the believer faced with what appears at times to be worldwide lawlessness. God will never allow complete disorder to exist in this world. We shall treat this at greater length in later chapters, he says. But the point is, God being a God of order, He will even use the Assyrian Empire or the Babylonian Empire to punish his own people who were disobedient for years and years and years, change. He's in control. He knows that everything has to work in decently in order in this life for there to be good of the church. We should never let ourselves worry to the point saying, well, it's all going to collapse. There will always be some sort of order. Now, it may not be what we want. And it doesn't mean that you can't have, like at the end of World War II in Germany, a, a, a policy where that whole country was ripped up one side and down the other. But, of course, that's the way God does things through nations to punish bad nations. And so on it goes. Nobody could foresee the USSR collapsing as quickly as it did. Nobody. How did it happen? 
Well, I guarantee you God being omniscient and knowing all that's object of knowledge, he knew exactly what was going to happen. And he didn't need the CIA to tell him. And we who are in the kingdom of the Lord, governed by the authority of Christ and the New Testament system, then we do all we can to be the leavening of good in the world by practicing the truth of the New Testament, the light of the world, salt of the earth, and God will preserve us. God will take care of us. Let me show you, and I'll stop here. When you had the destruction of Jerusalem, you had a lot of Christian Jews in that area and in Jerusalem. Did God know they were going to be put up against a hard place? Yes, He did. Forty years before that, Jesus gave them Matthew chapter 24 and said, when you see all these things, it's time to head for the hills, <laughs> literally. Go, because the end's come. God has always done for us what we could not do for ourselves. And in the unfolding of things down through time, and we must not forget this is studying the Bible, in the unfolding of the scheme of redemption, there was involving men and nations in ways that would not be necessarily the same now except to teach us God is in control. If I didn't believe that, I wouldn't pray. Why do you pray? Because you think he's in control. And that's why you say, not my will, but thine be done. That's why we study the model prayer, so we'll pray like he wants us to pray. So I want you to keep all these fundamental basic principles that are, we might say sometimes held behind the scenes and we don't see their connection relative to civil government. And then we'll just develop it more as time allows. And uh, there's a lot more I want to say. I would say how long we'd go, but I mentioned to the other two elders this morning, I'm not quite sure how long this will go. But uh, hopefully it won't be boring. And again, if you have any questions or whatever while I'm doing this, you feel free to ask. I don't guarantee I'll have the answer, <laughs> but I'll try to do something that'll help. Now we close this mindful of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Because it will continue on. When all the kingdoms of men along with this world have all gone off the scene, the elements have melted with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein have been burned up. The judgment day has come and gone and those wicked people have been consigned to a devil's hell eternally. And the blessed of the Father have been invited into their inheritance fulfilled in the glories of heaven. Then we will know exactly what it's like. to have everything done decently and in order. And in a sense, to live the Christian life is to say to God, I want it done. I want everything about me, and I want everything about my family, and I want everything about this country and my neighbors all to be in harmony with thy will. We want the will of God done. And we show him all our lives. That's what we're aiming at. And that's why the faithful will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, we beg you to do so. Believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of your past sins. As a child of God, let us rejoice in the exceeding great and precious promises that citizens of the kingdom all have as they labor to be faithful to the Lord in that great kingdom. For it will, it will go on. It will not cease at the end of this age. So if you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to do so while we stand and sing.